Listen and subscribe to the Growth Craft Startup Community Podcast on all the major podcast players, including iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere where podcasts are available. And leave a five-star review if you like it. We need those reviews to grow the show, and it's the easiest way to help us grow the show that you can do right now. So head on over to iTunes, head on over to Google Podcasts or Spotify, and leave a five-star review for the Growth Craft Startup Community Podcast. And tell all of your friends who are entrepreneurs to take a listen. And thanks. Hello, my name is Hassan Sorrells. This is Tom Libby, and you are listening to the Growth Craft Podcast. The Growth Craft Podcast is designed and committed to help the startup founder and is designed with the startup founder in mind. This podcast is committed to helping you grow your connections to our Growth Craft advisors, increase your engagement with the Growth Craft community, and to growing your knowledge about all of the benefits that Growth Craft can provide uh, for your project. We can't wait to bring you along on our journey today. Here on the podcast, we interview startup founders, advisors, and others about their journey, their process, their path, and of course, where they are going in the growth craft community. And today, I would like to welcome to the podcast, Robin Schaefer. Welcome to the podcast, Robin. Oh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. So for our listeners, for our viewers, what is it that you do exactly? Well, uh, my my mother asks me that all the time, and (laughs) so do my kids and and sometimes my husband. But basically, um, I am a consultant in the world of analyst relations, which very, very few people understand. So I'll give a quick quick overview. So analysts are third-party firms such as Gartner, Forrester, IDC, which a lot of people have heard of, and they are... um, um, somewhat like consumer reports. That's my best analogy, right? So while uh, consumers, if buying a refrigerator or a car or a toaster, would would check the ratings on consumer reports and and that would help them guide their decisions. You know, the the Harvey balls, which which one's better, which one's most cost-effective and which one fits for your, your needs. And in, in that sense, you know that the, um, the analysts there, those are analysts that actually evaluate each uh, product and make those uh, rankings. Mm-hmm. And those analysts are very, very impactful to, the, to Samsung and Toyota and those manufacturers because they're influencing the sale of their products. Well, the same thing happens in business technology. So if a business and enterprise is going to invest in some sort of technology solution for their finances or their customer relationship management or anything that, you know, as you know, enterprises have thousands and thousands of types of software there, they would um, consult with an analyst. And the analysts are these people from these firms, Gartner, Forrester, IDC, I mentioned again, because the people, most people know those names, that write research. And they also uh, consult with these buyers on their buying decisions and help them from, you know, I've got a problem, I don't know how to solve it, what kind of technology I should use, all the way down to vendor selection. They're very involved, so therefore they're very influential. And from that perch, where they're really seeing and understanding cons- customer, you know, enterprise needs, they also consult with vendors, with the people that sell those solutions and help them with better messaging, better products, and all that feedback that they give to the, the audience. So that's what an analyst is. And then what happens is every vendor, every seller of technology um, has somebody or a team or some p- persons that manage this analyst relations role. So they work as as an interface between that vendor and the analysts that are out there. And there are about 10,000 of these analysts and about 1,200 individual firms, just to give you an idea of the size. 
Wow. That's, that sounds like a huge ecosystem. Yeah, for sure. I, I was just going to ask. So, so Robin, you're an analyst relations consultant. So are you the one doing some of that work or how do you fit into that ecosystem? Yeah, great question. And, uh, and um, uh, something I'm, I'm frequently asked. So thank you for that. So what I do is I work on behalf of vendors, particularly startups. So I will work with them to educate them and help them and build for them a program of proactively managing the relationships with those analysts. So I will act in the relation, you know, just like you hire a PR agency yeah. to work between you, the vendor and the media, the journalists, you would engage me as an analyst relations agency to take care of that function for you. Um, and I either, you know, I either handle the whole thing or supplement in different ways the, 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 the staff that they have doing it. Okay. Um, I got to be honest. Um, I'm probably not as strong a data guy as I probably should be, right? And I'm probably not as good with the research as I, as I should be. Uh, like many entrepreneurs, um, I have sometimes probably many times, um, flown by the seat of my pants or gone by intuition and, and maybe jumped into a market without knowing exactly who my competitors were or what their right. strengths were or what the geographic area is. And then of course you find out things through the school of hard knocks, um, you have failure and then you walk away bruised, torn and rejected. <laughs> I do not think that that is an uncommon path <laughs> for many entrepreneurs. So, um, why should an entrepreneur, why should a startup founder um, use an analyst? What, what, what's the benefit to me as a startup founder, right? What, what thing are you stopping me from experiencing other than the bruising and the, the, the rejection and the, and, the, and, the, uh, and the loss of cash probably? What do you bring to the table that I should consider as a startup founder? It's, that's a, another great question. So most startups don't understand analyst relations, or they don't even know about analyst relations, most startups for whom it's relevant. And that would be B2B technology, people that are selling technology uh, via to other businesses. Um, or they misunderstand what it's about. They have some conceptions. So I'm an evangelist for bringing this knowledge to startups. It's a passion of mine. Um, pretty much all the other consultants and in the industry are working with much larger companies. But, you know, the heart is uh, the heart wants what the heart wants. And I love working with startups. So that's what I'm doing. Um, and why a startup would be interested in this is very, very interesting. So if they are a uh, technology vendor in business to business, there's two sides to where analyst relations can play for them. And um, one of my uh, mentors talks about it as learn and earn, right? So the earn side is how an analyst has access to the market and to customers and can help you get messages out there, get your, your brand out there, give you validity for what you're doing, can speak for you and mention you. So I'll give you an example, and that comes in a bunch of flavors. Some of them you would have to pay for, like you could hire an analyst to write a thought leadership paper or appear on a webinar with you. And that would be kind of more in the marketing realm, or sometimes they are involved in direct sales opportunities. So I had an experience when I was, um, before I was in analyst relations, and that was one of the things that really got me interested in it. I was at a, a vendor. A, a, a technology vendor, and I was running the customer relationship program. So most vendors have like customer marketing, customer testimonials, customer references, you know, all of those things, and they manage it. In, and that's what I did. That was my, my project. And I went, happened because we had an analyst contract. I went to an analyst and I told them, I said, I wanted some feedback on my strategy and how, and how I, was, I was rebuilding the whole program. And I, we talked about it and he was very helpful. And then he asked me what, if I was using technology. And I mentioned the two, there were like two major companies that sold this. I said, well, I'm looking at this one and this one, I'm leaning towards this one. We had a conversation about those two vendors. And then he said, 
have you heard of such and such startup hmm. in this space? And I said, no. He said, they're a very, very innovative and interesting new, hot new startup on the scene. And they are um, battling, you know, for some mind share with those, those big guys. And I think that the way they think about, the way they approach the problem, the way they solve the problem is very much aligned with your strategy. And I think you should check them out. And I then contacted them. I spoke to the founder. Uh, I put them on my long list. I put them on my short. Well, I have only had a short list, really. There was only two other ones. I put them <laughs> on my short list and I ended up buying from them. So okay. I wouldn't have any idea that these guys even existed. And an analyst has an opportunity to mention, to cover, and to help you get your name out there in the market. So that's the earn side. And that's the area that people are people that no analyst relations are fairly familiar with get into a report, you know, these reports that, you know, evaluate vendors, you want to get into one of them and there's different things that you do. And that's all on the earn side. The other side is the learn side, which is I think much more interesting for startups because analysts um, will give you feedback. So from their experience as researchers of your market knowing all your competitors, knowing the customer needs, knowing the trends, you know, all that knowledge that they've accumulated, they can give you incredible feedback. So in your situation, Hazan, when you were saying you go in, you don't really know who the competitors are, you don't know what the market needs are, you don't know how to hit the nail on the head to, 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 to hit that market, to make that market work for you. An analyst has a, an amazing capability, more than probably any other source of giving you really clear feedback, okay? Now, there's a caveat to it because if you want in-depth feedback, if you really wanna have a conversation, you wanna get guidance, you know, they're not gonna do that for free, right? That's gonna be a commercial relationship. So we hold that because we know startups don't have deep pockets, right? So we hold that to the side. And what I say to my clients is the first thing we're going to do is get every ounce of value we can get for free. Because analysts want, they pride themselves on knowing what's happening in the market. They study a market. And if, I, if I'm a customer reference provider, reference software provider, and I'm in that market, the analyst needs, the analyst wants to know about the disruptive, interesting new technologies that are out there. And they will take, edu they will tell call, they will take calls known as briefings from startups. They're interested, even if you don't have any customers, even if you're on a, on a, on a minimal, uh, a, a uh, minimal, I can't think of the word, you know, MVP. Yeah. MVP. I couldn't yes. think of that. That's okay. MVP. <laughs> And you don't have a, a fully blown uh, grown product out there, even if you're still in the stealth mode, they want to know what's up. If, 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 if you have a truly interesting, innovative, differentiated idea. If you're me too, if you're doing the same thing everybody else is doing a little faster, a little cheaper, a little better, not interesting to them. If you've got something really interesting and a new way to look at pro a problem and a new way to solve a problem, they want to know about it. They want to find, they want to hitch, hitch their wagon on your star. So I, I, I know you have a question, Hassan, but I got, I got to ask this because I, I, I try to play the devil's advocate sometimes here, right? And as you're talking, the first thing that I can think of is then what, what stops the bias, right? Like if, if mm -hmm. certain analysts won't go beyond a certain point without getting paid, then, then doesn't that lend to some, I, I don't want to say shady practices. I don't mean it that way. Because I, yes. I, I, I would expect that if you're analytically driven and you're an analyst, that you have your, your, your heart tells you that analytics matter and numbers don't lie and blah, blah, all that other stuff, right? But how, how do you discern between what's pure and true and what somebody really loves versus what somebody got paid for? As a consumer, I think that, like I, I have a hard time with that. I have a hard time looking at some of those, you know, top 10 lists of this software or top 10, like, cause some analyst Deloitte puts this out or whatever. And I'm a forester put stuff out and I'm like, okay, well, how much of that is sponsored? Like, I don't even understand. Like, so I'm not sure what to believe and what not to believe it as a consumer. So as I, if I'm a, if I'm a startup, how do I understand and know which analysts are going to treat my product 
like it deserves versus I have to pay them to treat it the way that I want them to treat it. You know what I mean? So I, I, hope, I hope I'm explaining that. Well. You are absolutely explaining it. And it is um, one of the most complex and nuanced and confusing <laughs> situations out there. Okay. Because good analysts, and I have never met, I've hardly ever met a bad one. Good analysts um, will not um, say nice things about you for money if they're if they're truly have scruples. And most of them, almost all of them that I've met really pride themselves on that, that they they do their darndest to remain unbiased. And if you pay them, you're not paying them to write nice things about you, right? Because they won't do that. Most of them will say, I will not talk about you. I will not, you can't pay me enough money to talk about you specifically. They won't even talk about you necessarily. What they will do, and this is a good example, an example, just say you're in a market, you're in a cybersecurity market, and you're about, you know, protecting uh, data at the pack, of, I don't know, data in the at the source, you know, that's, that's the kind of solution you do. What they would do is consult with you on maybe who you might see as your target buyer, where the white spaces are in messaging, and help you think through how to market and how to position yourself. They might help you think through if you're trying to make decisions on your product roadmap, what features and functionality are going to be most effective. So they may, you know, sit at the side of the table with you um, thinking in private about these, this thing. And that's where you pay them for that. You pay them for that. It's like a consulting, but they have to keep like a, a, a wall up between that and their advisory to buyers. And, and they have to be very unbiased in how they present themselves to the market, right? And they are, and they really maintain that neutrality when they evaluate vendors. They kind of put out of their head who paid them, who's not paid them, and they're not thinking about that at all. They're really looking. Um, so what I was starting to say about cybersecurity, they will write a paper, for example, a thought leadership paper about why you need to protect that data and what the dangers are. They're not going to mention you. They're not going to mention your technology, but they're going to warm up the market because they're going to talk about the education that buyers need to have before they can even appreciate your value proposition. So they might write that. They might do some custom research. So they may do some, like if they do a webinar, typically, they will not talk about you at all, but they'll talk about industry issues that the market you're trying to get to would be interested in, like 10 things to know about whatever. I mean, not about vendors, but about you know, the challenges in that industry. So your target buyer is going to be interested in that and come to hear this analyst speak. And they're not going to talk about you at all. They're going to talk about the issues, da, da, da. And then you have a little commercial at the end, like, oh, you know, we help with some of the problems that, you know, the this analyst talked about. So, yes, they are they are unbiased, right? And um, and yes, there are some bottom feeders, I call them, out there. And when you when you're you're around the market for a while, you know who those are and you know how to avoid them like the plague. And they're not the big ones. So you start with the big ones and the reputable companies. Um and I lost my train of thought. So go on to the next question. I was going to make another <laughs> brilliant point. Well, <laughs> raw honesty is what we support here on the Growth Craft Podcast. Absolutely, uh, we, we heard that in our last episode, so it's good. You're 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 on. You're well on. You're well on track. Um, yeah. Let me ask you a question because this is there's about eight different things, and, and Tom can tell if you're watching the video of this podcast by just looking at my facial expressions that I, I have about eight different cascading questions in my head now. But I'm going to try to distill it down to one because I'm very excited now about this because now I'm sort of seeing applications for what you're you're talking about. Um, not to say that I wasn't excited to talk to you before, but now I'm really excited, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, so um, let me give you a for instance uh, because maybe this will sort of frame up for people. You mentioned cybersecurity, right? Um, I'm going to pretend that I'm a startup founder. I'm going to put it in for instance. So let's say I'm a startup founder who's created a company or or has come up with an idea. Um, and it's a cool hack for webinars and learning management software systems. And I want to target that that product to, let's say, the um, the healthcare market specifically because healthcare market is gigantic. Specifically, 
the um the the long-term care market right um senior living assisted living dementia that kind those kinds of those, that kind of, that kind of market i come to you right i've got my webinar lms idea i say i've got no money but i've got proof of concept here because let's say i came out of that industry and i got a handful of clients i know a little bit about how this industry works but not enough to be able to sort of i think make some money in the way that i want to make it how do i work with you how does that I, yeah. Walk me through the, sort of the nuts and bolts of yeah, how that's a, that's a great... like myself would work with you. Join us online via Zoom at the Growthcraft Startup Community Founders Forum each third Tuesday of the month at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Look, advisors and founders, we're, we're all in this together. Building relationships with your peers and entrepreneurship is just as important as connecting with experts and advisors. Each month, every third Thursday, we'll meet online via Zoom to share ideas, get support, support each other, and talk about universal issues that nearly all startups share. We'll celebrate our victories, chat about challenges, and then break out into small groups to address a timely topic of interest. It's a great way to meet like-minded entrepreneurs. Check out the links to the third Tuesday events on the GrowthCraft website and join us at the GrowthCraft Startup Community Founders Forum in the show notes below the podcast player you're listening to right now. That's another great question. So here's here's how I work and what I believe, because I said before, you get all the value you can get for free mm -hmm. first, right? Right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find some uh, second tier analysts, safe analysts, right? Friendly analysts that we can share this is my vision. This is where we're going. This is the, the software we've developed to solve this problem. And I'll help, and I would help you build that story out, how you tell your story to an analyst. And then we would go and an analyst would grant us a free briefing because we've we've indicated we've sold ourselves as worth their time. And there's a little bit of selling that you have to do to prove to an analyst that, that you are worth their time and they shouldn't get to know you. So you have to talk a little bit about, in, and when you pitch them for a briefing, why it, why you're so different and better and you know whatever. And then you do the briefing, which um, gives you the opportunity to explain that and, and give that, that, uh, that education like a pitch. Um, What'll happen is a couple of things. You're going to get this. The analyst is either going to be engaged or not engaged, right? If you go to Gartner, mostly Gartner, Forrester, IDC that I mentioned before, the, 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 mm -hmm. the big gorillas, mm -hmm. they're going to be pretty tight-lipped on that kind of call. Okay. But if you go to a second tier firm and there's dozens and dozens of second tier firms that are reputable that I know that you could go to and you give them your pitch, they're going to be much more forthcoming in feedback and interaction. Interesting. They're going to ask you a lot of questions. They're going to um, give you verbal cues and body language, you know, how they're reacting. You're going to know, even with the top analysts, a lot of feedback without them actually even giving you any feedback. If they're immediately go to their email, you can tell they're not even hardly paying attention or they're giving you, a, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. and then at the end of the call, they say, okay, don't call me. I'll call you, you know, mm -hmm. kind of, uh, it's not me, it's you, whatever, you know, breakup uh, language, nice breakup language. You know, you haven't impressed that analyst and you either need to tell your story better the next time and we can de debrief. Uh, and what we, usually what we do is say, okay, how do we tell it better in a more compelling way? Let's attack that first. And if we tell it a couple of times that we get the same reaction, we may not have something. We may not have such a good idea. We thought it was a great idea, but before we invest tons of time and effort, we can kind of get the smell test, I like to call it. You know, did the analysts... Um, respond curious are they excited about that if they are they're going to want to hear more they're going to want do you have a demo can you tell me do you have a customer yet you using it if not okay i want to hear about how you develop and they're going to be enthusiastic so that's the first thing you're going to get some feedback from that and the other thing you're going to do is you're going to be able to vet these analysts right 
Mm-hmm. So you can tell because they're they're talking to you and they're engaging. Is this somebody that knows what they're by the nature of their questions and the, by the nature of the conversation? Is this somebody I want to work with in more depth or not? Do I click with this person? Because so much of it is a personal thing. And then we can explore eventually a commercial relationship to, to get into the really deep dive um, feedback and analysis for you. Okay. That makes sense? Yes, absolutely. That was great. Yeah. I was just thinking like, so, so you're talking about a lot of this stuff, like you go after, you help, you'll, you're going to help the the company go after these second tier, like get as much as you can get for free or whatever. So their only cost really is your time. So I'm not going to ask you rates or anything like that. I'm not going to insult you like that on the podcast, but my, so my question, my only question was, is it based on an hourly rate or a project rate? Like, is it like a one lump sum that you do work for, or is it like based on a sort of like a retainer thing where you get a number of hours for a certain number of dollars and like you go through that. How, how do people, uh, and, and if that, if I guess my question is, is that typical for the for the consultant interaction version of like a stage of this? Or is it like, a is, are you different than, than the, what we would expect typically uh, addressed as like consultant type thing? Yeah, you know, when I go to a typical startup scale up that may be, 25 million or higher, you know, in, in ARR. So they're ready for a true program. They're really ready to start engaging with analysts in a regular way. And I have clients that have no investment other than me. They're big, they're way bigger than some of these startups. And they have no investment in analyst firms other than me because I won't let them. I won't let them spend on them until we can find a really clear ROI. And they only pay me and they outsource the whole thing to me and it's a monthly rate and that's the, that's the way it works. With the really small startups, what I usually do is, is um, first of all, I talk to them and we figure out if there's a there there. You know, there's not always a winner that... It, Analyst relations is not going to work for everybody. And, 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 you know, not to go through the whole details here, but we can talk for 15 or 20 minutes and I can say kind of, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. And I, you know, I'm not really going to hear, or maybe I have to do a little research or something and I can give them a, like, like it's worth, it's worth doing something. And then usually what I do with the small companies is do some searching around to see what kind of, like I do a project where I might search around and see what kind of coverage there is in the area, who the analysts we might talk to and do some exploratory work with them. I might help them with a briefing deck. And it's, I guess it's sort of hourly. It depends on, you know, the client and what they need and how much, yeah. but I'm, I'm very flexible in whatever with the startups, with whatever they need to just take their first step. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. When thinking about um, that typical engagement and thinking about how that typical engagement works, um, what are some uh, some traditional challenges that you experience inside of that engagement in working with a startup? I mean, I, I think you already mentioned a couple of big ones, which is like, you don't really have anything there. Or yeah. you're too me too, right? Yeah. Um, you saw a crowded market and you're like, hey, I'm going to jump in. Like, I wouldn't, that's why I was very specific in sort of my example of like webinar and LMS in this market, right? Because the smaller you are, the more specific you are, the more chance you have to win a niche on a, on a long tail, right? Um, which is the, the market environment overall, the economic environment overall that we live in right now in the United States yeah. um, and in the West in general. But, um, but if I'm too me too, right? If I'm not, D- differentiated enough, right? Um, if my idea just is driven by passion, but I don't really have any really good insights, th- those are a couple of big, probably telltale signs for you. Mm-hmm. Um, could you walk us through a couple of more? Like, what are some yeah. things where we're like, eh, yeah, maybe that's not a good bet for me to work on? Yeah, it, 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 there there has to be some passion behind it too. You know, if you can't get excited about what you're doing and show and demonstrate passion and have that maybe personal qualities, you know, might be some personal qualities to express that. That's going to be really tough to work with. So if you're, you're me too, um, you don't have a passion. You're not like a, a really good spokesperson because you have to be in a, in a sales convincing mode, but guess what? If you're not, you're in a hell of a time with investors and customers. So 
It's not, I'm not alone yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then the other thing, which you can't know ahead of, uh, until we look is, um, are there, is there much coverage on this? Oh, the other, I'm sorry. There's another thing even before that. There, it, so I was going to say, is there, is there a lot of activity on this? Are there animals covering this? Are there people, are we going to get, and I've encountered businesses, business areas that there just isn't enough there to make it worth your while. The other thing is who you're targeting, who you aspire to target in terms of size of company. If you're going after SMB, you have an SMB product for SMBs and you have no um, aspiration to go up market to enterprise, you're not going to have a ton of impact. And the reason is that all of pretty much every large enterprise uses analysts to make decisions. Smaller, smaller firms, uh, smaller companies, your targets aren't going to use them as much. So you have much less opportunity for those analysts to influence your business. So I will talk about what is, so even if you're selling to SMB now, but you aspire to enterprise, you should, you should start to work there. If enterprise is your primary target, you have to, like there's no choice. Join the Growth Craft Startup community online via Zoom each first Tuesday of the month at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time for Expert Tuesdays. With Expert Tuesdays, you'll hear from one of our top-notch expert advisors and thought leaders in an informative workshop or presentation focusing on a topic important to emerging and growing companies. From sales and marketing to storytelling and leadership, in this hour-long monthly session, you will be able to connect with the Growth Craft community, advisors, founders, and others. And you'll learn entrepreneurship skills you can apply to your startup project uh, right now. Check out the links to the Growth Craft website to join us on Expert Tuesdays in the show notes below the podcast player you're listening to right now. And thanks. Interesting. Let's um, let's switch gears a little bit here, right? And let's talk a little bit about Growth Craft, your involvement yeah. with Growth Craft, what attracted you to Growth Craft. Now, I, so Growth Craft, uh, for all of you who don't know and haven't seen a single thing from Growth Craft, we're pretty much targeting on the startup community, right? So aside from the obvious, because you've mentioned startups several times here, that so you like startups, you enjoy working with startups, the whole that whole nine yards. Talk to us a little bit about what attracted you to growth craft and, and what, what, you know, what you like about it, what the, what yeah. the, you know, what the positives are for you there. Yeah. I started uh, working with uh, me. I met some growth craft people months and months and months ago, like maybe a year ago when it was just a, a germ of an idea. And I was very excited about it because I saw the need you know, the way Growthcraft is organized is there's core advisors for the fun fundamental things that every business needs, finance and marketing and, you know, leadership and HR and different things that everybody needs. And then there's niche advisors like myself that, you know, only some of the companies need, you know, because I don't help everybody. And I love that model. And I love the fact there was a really low cost um, way to get involved in a community that gives you networking and education and that you could take advantage of all of these mentors and advisors to the degree that it's going to help you and it's going to be relevant. So I love that model. And because, like I said earlier, I, I just love evangelizing this concept because it's so 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 little un, un understood, non understood, misunderstood, misunderstood. That's misunderstood. the word I was going for. <laughs> um, and and not not understood um, in the market. And I just see so much opportunity sitting on the table that I just love. I just get very passionate about. Um, the topic. And then I saw growth craft as a super, I just love the whole model of the way the organization is structured. I think, I think Kaysan and I need to do a podcast episode with just the two of us going back and forth about, about growth craft. Like what do we, <laughs> neither one of us was, get to answer that question. <laughs> I was just thinking that myself, like we need to interview each other and just, just popcorn back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> we, um, we've asked that, we've asked that question so many times and that I, it just hit me that we never get to answer that question. But never, I right. But, you can go ahead. You can say, you're wrong. This is what it's about. <laughs> well, um, 
One thing that, that sort of has occurred to me before I ask you our, our final sort of penultimate question, um, and, and again, I want to thank you for your time. I really enjoyed you coming on the podcast. I learned more about industry analysis now than I'd ever possibly could. could than you ever wanted to know. Never yeah, could possibly know, and I'm sure there's way more. We just began yeah. to skim the surface. I've come um, to realize I think I need Robin's help. How's that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So have I, actually. <laughs> we might be, so might be doing some side I want conversation. To make a little plug that I have Absolutely. a book. I actually wrote a book on this subject, believe it or not. And I'm coming out with the second edition in September. So a little plug for that. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Well, I was going to ask you, do you have anything to promote on the podcast today? But we'll get to that in a minute. I want to ask you this question first, which kind of goes back to what you do with startups a little bit. So you're in the B2B space, right? A lot of people don't understand the difference between B2B, B2C, D2C. You know, they don't, they don't understand, uh, you know, owning B2B both B2C. sides. B2B, <laughs> right, exactly. Or, or even like, oh my gosh, I've even seen one where it was B2B, D2C. And I was like, yeah. how do you, what is that? Like, I don't even know what that yeah. is. Uh, right, what, is, what are we doing here? So explain to folks a little bit about sort of what does B2B mean versus B2C? Like, I, I know what that means, right? Yeah, sure, um, sure. But other people may not may not know. And I know I should have front-loaded this one. Yeah, but sure, definitely. Like a, so a um, B2B simply means um, the business, I'm, I'm a business, I'm selling to another business. So if I have technology, um, I'm, so I'm selling technology to an, a small, another company that's going to use my technology in the operations of their business, right? Mm -hmm. So that's essentially what B2B is. Um, now, uh, so B2C, so, so there are companies that make, you know, phones, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, um, iPhones and, iPhone. and different things, yeah. the consumer technology, tons and tons of consumer technology. There's not this kind of ecosystem for consumer technology hmm. other than consumer reports right. or Yelp or, you know, those things. There's not a, a, a formal analyst um, structure in, in, in that uh, consumer environments. Is that because there's just so many C's and there's so few B's? Is that why? Like there's so many consumers, like yeah, I think of, you know, I think of you talked about cell phone technology, right? I think Apple sells how many billions of phones, you know, per year, like, you know, you just hit a certain J curve, and then you're just gone and you're servicing yeah. almost I, all the market. I think so. I think that's part of it that like a consumer, you know, there's a lot of that advising consumers that goes on through the media, you all see the the, the ten through the through the media and through peer reviews. You know, yeah. through mm -hmm. things like Yelp and Travel Advisor and all those things, so people are advising, and you go to Home Depot and you can see the ratings on you know this screwdriver versus that screwdriver and whatever. So there's a lot out there. So the B two B, even though B two B has some of that rating, also peer review rating, also this expert and analyst role is a different one um, that only exists really in the B two B environment. Awesome. Don't get me started about reviews again. We're not going to go there today. <laughs> we already did a whole thing on reviews. I'm not even going to get into it. Go back and listen to a couple of previous episodes. Okay. <laughs> Just reviews. <laughs> well, Robin, thank you for coming on our podcast today. We really enjoyed talking with you. Again, you've opened up the world of, um, of B2B, you know, industry analyst relations and how that works for us. Um, what would you like to promote today? Obviously your book, but what else would you like? And book and your really second edition, whatever else is all coming out. But talk a little bit about yeah. the book. Talk a little bit about how we can get it. Um, and what what we're what we're looking at. Here. Well, the book the book is on Amazon now, and you, you'll be able to get the second edition. I'm I'm hoping in in September. Okay. So we're working working uh, finalizing it now. Congratulations! Um, yeah, congratulations. You. What's the uh, what's the name of the book, by the way? It's Analysts on Analyst Relations. And what what I did is I there are a couple of books out there on on analyst relations written by analyst relations people. So it's people like me telling you how to do your job, right? Mm -hmm. So I said, wouldn't it be interesting to write a whole book on what the analysts think? What do the analysts want in a briefing? What do the analysts think about how you create categories? What do the analysts think about all these different topics? And then I interviewed, I have about 50 analysts represented and I've interviewed them and I have um, you know, a whole lot of different topics. So an analyst relations, person is the audience 
So a person that specializes in this and they can hear right from all of these analysts what they want and get all the insight on how they can do their job better. So the market is for analyst relations people. I want to promote one other thing. Mm -hmm. um, I worked with the University of Edinburgh on a research project and did this uh, in 2022, we did the research project. And what we wanted to do is get some data behind this idea that analysts can help startups, right? So we kind of knew it, know it intuitively, but we wanted to get some data. So we worked with the university and we did a research study of, of we asked startups, analysts, and VCs accelerators as like the third leg of the stool. And we put together a, um, a, a research project and a research report, which you can find on my site, which is um, uh, schaferar.com. Um, and we can put that maybe in the show notes. Mm -hmm. And um, so my buddy, Chris Holscher, who is another AR um, consultant, and I run a video interview series on startups and analyst relations. So these are, um, we haven't, we've only started it in January, February. So we don't have a whole lot of it, uh, addition, um, shows out there, mm -hmm. episodes out there, episodes, that's the word I was looking for. Um, but they're really, really rich. And I would recommend that people check those out if they want to know more about analyst relations. Every show is packed with information. Awesome. And we will have links, as Robin said, to Robin's book. Um, we will have links to um, where you can connect with Robin on LinkedIn and on social media. Um, of course, uh, we will have a link to um, where you can find Robin's show. Uh, I believe it's on YouTube, right? Yeah, it's on YouTube. Yep, absolutely. Where you can find all your all those show episodes on YouTube and every place where you can connect with Robin Schaefer in order to find out more about, well, the industry you're attempting to make a dent in. Once again, I would like to thank oh. our guest, Robin Schaefer. Uh, this is Tom Libby, and I'm Hassan Sorrells, and we're out. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Thanks for having me. Each second Thursday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time, join Growth Crab live and in person at Second Thursdays at CIC, located at 1 Broadway, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Located at Kendall Square, CIC features the most engaging entrepreneurial community in the Northeast, right next to MIT and minutes from Harvard University and downtown Boston. With 250,000 square feet of professionally managed, flexible workspace, CIC has every office amenity you could possibly need to scale your startup project. For those of you who are local, or if you're just visiting Boston, GrowthCraft advisors and founders can meet others in our community face-to-face. Join us for an informal social and informational get together. Meet others, chat with advisors and peers, make connections, and then stay for Venture Cafe starting at 4.30 p.m. Eastern every second Thursday at CIC. Check out the links to the GrowthCraft website to join us live and in person at Second Thursdays at CIC in the show notes below the podcast player you're listening to right now. And thanks.